Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce you to the next two people who are here to, to, um, to meet with you and to speak with you. Uh, on my right, I have Gian Altari, who is a award-winning producer, director, writer, and visual artist, originally from Egypt, now living in, Par in France, Paris. She has produced documentaries for the BBC, for PBS, Arte, since 1990. She's not only a, a wonderful filmmaker, but she also mentors and teaches documentary production at various institutions, and she served on many boards. So welcome, Gian. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and on my left, I, have, I would like you to welcome Julia Dar, who is an international award-winning Norwegian director all the way from Norway via Rwanda. Um, and she is motivated, motivated to telling character-led stories that highlight important human rights and sustainable development issues. She has had the distinction of being listed by Forbes magazine as one of the top 30 under 30 year olds that are driving and defining the media world. And she has just finished her first feature, Thank You for the Rain, which will be premiering tomorrow night at 9.15 at the showroom too. So I hope you'll all be able to go and see it. It's a second screening on Tuesday morning. Great. So. <laughs> And as, we've, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning, as we can make this as interactive as possible. Gian's going to start, and then we'll have time for some questions. And so start thinking of good questions to ask, because you have two wonderful brain trusts here to tap into. So Gian, I'm interested in finding out about your wonderful storied career. <laughs> You've uh, made a lot of different types of films, and you um, uh, now are making more long historical archive type films. So let's hear the long, wonderful history of how you got to that point. Well, um, uh, well, I guess the history starts with a single frame. I, uh, I started my career as a still photographer, actually. So it was one picture. Um, but very quickly, um, not very quickly, uh, a while later, um, I uh, started doing uh, more reportage kind of story-led, um, uh, character-led uh, documentaries. And I worked on this um, uh, in a production company in France called Kappa. We did this um, monthly 52-minute documentary series called 24 Hours. And um, I think I did about 35 of them in one year. And I guess at some point when you put together um, a documentary every month, you start wondering, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think what, what really got me is that it, it became very obvious very quickly that making the film wasn't the issue. W what, what am I saying and why am I doing this? And, and at that point, um, I think a lot of what uh, Francesca was saying, Fernanda, Fernanda, Fernanda <laughs> was, uh, was saying really does apply. Uh, why am I saying this? How do I want to say it? All these questions are very relevant. Um, and then I, it, you start wondering, well, what do I want to say and how do I want to say it? What is the story? And in a very funny way, the stories you need to tell somehow find you rather than you finding them. You start getting obsessed with this one thing and you don't know why. Uh, <laughs> and at some point, the, the question that turns it into a film becomes um, the one thing you can think of the whole time. And so what I, uh, I, I personally wanted to tell stories from my perspective. I come from Africa, and everything that was being told was being told about us. And my voice, I couldn't find anywhere. And my perspective of history, how I saw history, where I fit in history, uh, and unraveling some of the stories that were never told to us. We don't know a lot of our history. Um, that became my obsession. And so, um, uh, 
digging for stories, digging for parts of stories that are not easy to find uh, becomes a bit of a game. And, uh, um, and so, and how, how do you tell them? It's very easy to find someone who's very uh, charismatic, uh, and that I had done with, with a lot of the Kappa films, the 24 hours films, uh, observational, you find a character that you start filming and they lead you down the narrative. Um, but I wanted to do it differently, so I went back to old school, back to classic talking heads. And because, as I said earlier, I come from a space where story storytelling is the real um, cohesion of a community, um, I felt that uh, anecdotes were my thing. So um, maybe we can start with showing you one of the anecdotes. Great. <laughs> um, so who am I talking to? Uh, back. Stingers. Let's do the stingers. <laughs> So I guess finding the person who is an eyewitness, who is sitting in the room to tell us from his point of view uh, a bit of that history was one way I was trying to piece together uh, some of the stories I wanted to know about. And um, so that gets me a bit into interview. Interview, I love interviews, because an interview really is about, it's a game, and we both know that we need to interact so each one gets out of it what they want. And somehow, every one of us wants to talk. But what do you want to say? How do you get to say it? What are the conditions? It's all about this, um, this fair game that you're really coming into it, um, not just grabbing and taking and leaving. So a lot of the time, I, when I start, I do a lot of research interviews first before I start filming. Um, first thing I say, well, do you, want, do you want to ask me any questions? So it sort of throws them off a bit. <laughs> but, but there are people who start questioning me. <laughs> and, and I think the, the thing about interview, somebody once told me when you go do an interview, the key is that you should know about the person more than he can remember about himself. Um, which is very, very good advice. And I'll tell you an anecdote. I was interviewing President uh, um, um, Seveni of uh, Uganda. And he was going on about this and this, and I never did this. And I was like, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. President, you did? Um, and he said, no, of course not. And I had read and kept such a very detailed um, log of the things that I needed to know, that I told him, yes, in, uh, in uh, McCrary University when you talked about this, and he looked at me, he said, I did. And suddenly it sort of completely changed his posture. And I think it's not about tricking people, it's really about getting the conversation, getting it towards a conversation rather than a Q&A. And when the other person realizes that you know, that you know a lot, they somehow not are scared but are worried that you'll catch them out a second time. So the the conversation comes down a notch. And the next thing is is to get that person in a space where they forget you're there and they sit back and reminisce and tell the stories they've always wanted to tell. Because, you know, everybody wants to be part of history and everyone has the story they really want to share. And the people I usually interview have stories that affect history. So let's get the second clip, Devlin. Well, he was eventually killed. Um, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't make him tell that story. He was sitting in front of a camera, and he was, and you know, in history books, he'll come down as the person who gave the order to assassinate Lumumba. And he, at that point in his life, he was willing to tell that story. 
Um, so I think it's also um, the way a story is told. He's saying it is an anecdote, he did that, the toothpaste story, all of that. I think the levels of things that come through in a single anecdote is so much more than um, just seeing, or an anecdote has so many levels that are international politics, personal politics, the, the climate of the, uh, and the atmosphere of things, you know, it's just so layered that it captures quite a bit. So anyway, just to move on, I think I'm, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but of course to start telling um, complicated, long, big, historic stories, archive. And the queen of archives, I'm sitting next to the queen of archives. Um, uh, uh, but because I wanted to tell my stories from a different perspective, from a perspective of, of Africa, um, the, of course, there's a lot of footage all over the world. It's more or less easy to access very expensive, but the eye of the camera tells its own story. And one of the things I've been trying to do over the years is to find local footage. So, or, the, or, or home footage, local footage. I've spent uh, months, okay, I'll say ten, one more anecdote. Um, not this film about the Congo, I did another film about the Congo. Uh, called The Tragedy of the Great Lakes, and uh, which was about Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. And I wanted to have local archives, and it was so difficult to get in. And eventually, I realized that they're blocking me only because the archives, there are no logs. So if they let me in, they wouldn't know what to do with me. So I made a deal. I said, okay, if you let me in, uh, Everything I see, I will log for you. So if anyone goes in to find footage in the Congo, there's a whole roster with my handwriting in it. I spent a month just logging uh, footage. But the state of the archive is terrible. Sometimes you'd open boxes and termites would fly out at you. But then other times you'd look at footage and not even believe that this exists. And so there's a whole treasure trove out there telling the same story probably, but from a very different perspective, and a perspective that I, as a filmmaker, uh, have the opportunity to include as part of our collective history. So uh, finding and including archive, um, the thing about trying to tell a story from a different perspective is that you keep your ear open to differences. And I made this film called Cuba's African Odyssey, which started off as a film about proxy wars in Africa. And as I was researching, the, I found I was uh, declassifying, a, a, I start with declassifying, uh, um, uh, footage. not footage, um, material. material. Um, and I got this one declassified telegram that basically told the exact opposite story of everything I had read, everything, over the, the past year of research. So I couldn't really let it go. Um, and basically what it was uh, hinting at, that the relationship between Cuba and, and the Soviet Union was extremely bad at a time where everything I had worked on uh, said that Cuba was the proxy for, for the Russians. So I decided to go uh, and just literally knock on doors and say, and find uh, the, um, the soldiers who had gone to the Congo with Che Guevara. And a completely different story came out. Um, and, okay, let me start off by by showing the archive. Um, it, I, I started this on a wrong footing because it's a bigger story. I'm not sure how much people know about that. But to, to, to put it in a nutshell, we've always presumed that Cuba, 
was in the Congo on behalf of the Russians. And after interviewing all the soldiers who had gone with Che Guevara to the Congo, I realized it was a completely opposite story. And what they were doing was trying to hide that they were in the Congo from the Russians. So uh, the Che clip, please. Well, uh, the thing about these, uh, uh, these pictures um, is that it was one thing saying that Che was disguised to go to the Congo and the rest of it, but to actually find these pictures and find the guy who's telling you the story in the pictures, um, I think it gives a completely different weight to the narrative and then you start thinking of how to tell that story. Um, uh, why I make films, I think that's one, um, my, my, I've been working with the same editor for 18 years and uh, my last film, uh, which was the first film I ever did about my country, Egypt, and I was really excited and I was telling him what the film was about and he looked at me very bored and he said, oh, so we're making the same film again. Um, and I guess that um, for me, I've been obsessed with um, my continent and all the hopes and all the uh, possibilities uh, that came with independence. And the central question to every single one of my films is what on earth happened? <laughs> and so as Jean Renoir said, um, directors can make the same film over and over again and it's never the same one. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And we're very glad you've made those same films over and over and over again. We have some handheld mics, and we have time for a few questions for Giannis. Anyone have some questions? Here's someone in the front row. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there was anywhere that we can watch your films. Um, and if not, could you please tell me what a stinger is? I'm desperate to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, distribution is our Achilles heel, uh, but uh, I will send you links. Um, some of them were distributed on Arte, but with Archive, once the, uh, uh, the 10 years are over, you can't get them anymore, but uh, voila. A stinger is, it was a, it's a weapon, it's a handheld weapon that at the time, it was the first handheld weapon that could uh, fire at airplanes. The Mujahideen in Afghanistan were the first to use them, and it completely changed the course of the war. Do we have another question? Someone down here. Hand Sorry, up. I just wanted to ask. I couldn't. I I couldn't hear. I can hear, but you said your your films. You're preoccupied with the same question in all of the films, and then I couldn't hear what what was that question. So, could you say a little more about that? Yeah. Um, well, I was talking about um, uh, since independence on the African continent, there was so much hope. There was so much vision about how our future would shape up. And my central question is, what happened with that option? <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for sharing all this knowledge. I actually have a question uh, talking about interviews. Um, it seems like one of the advice that you gave was know more about the person than they remember about themselves. And obviously that's really important for when you're interviewing precedents or people that have shaped history. But when you're uh, interviewing regular people, is there any advice you can give uh, for us documentary filmmakers that are maybe not dealing with like people that are changing history, yeah. but <laughs> people that are in their own way participating in history, but there's no chance to really read about them or know about them beforehand? Well, I, I personally think that knowing the person and interacting and honestly being interested in their lives and allowing them to be interested in your life 
It is about being on, I mean, what we do isn't just to go and take from people's lives. It's about making this a two-way street. So with, with, with anyone, when I go and interview um, someone who is baking bread, I need to be genuinely interested. I'm not just there to use them to fill in a gap in my film, because immediately that will show. And it's, it's when you open yourself up to the other person, it, sometimes they reveal the most amazing things that you wouldn't have even suspected. And sometimes you reveal to yourself some things about yourself. You know, so I just think it's about truly, and the other thing is to be willing to walk away from an interview, I think is really important. There are, um, and yeah, and there are ethical questions. I'll tell you another story. Um, well, I, when I was doing this film, the Cuba's African Odyssey, obviously uh, Henry Kissinger was, my A on, on my list that I needed him desperately. If you're telling a Cold War story, Henry Kissinger is vital. And I had already interviewed him for a previous film um, I did called um, The House of Saud. And he sent me a message saying that, uh, you know, okay, half an hour is this much and an hour is this much. And I'm like, uh, no, I don't pay. And previously, I had sent him an email with 14 reasons why it's in his interest that I interview him. And his secretary sent back, and your 14 points won't work this time. Uh, and I'm like, OK. And I tried to find a way out. And then at, at the end of it, I realized it's either I pay or I don't. So I sent him a, a, a message saying, Dr. Kissinger, Long after you are dead, we will still tell the story of the Cold War. Thank you very much. And I did not interview him. And, and, and it really was um, a decision about why I interview people, how I interview people, and what it means for the film. So with a person, you might find the best person character-wise for an observational film. But if that person is dodgy and you feel that, that maybe you shouldn't do the film. I don't think a film should be done at any price. There needs to be a reason, it needs to be um, real for you as well as for the people. Well said. <laughs> so, I'm going to turn now to Julia. And as I mentioned earlier, Julia has a wonderful, her first feature called Thank You for the Rain, which is playing tomorrow night. And I thought it would be wonderful, uh, tonight, sorry, <laughs> pardon me, Saturday, tonight, night, 9, 10. If you could tell us a little bit about how you came to this film and how you came to be involved in it and also some of the challenges that you confronted making it. Yes. Um, could I please get the first slide up? Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm here with, uh, with Thank You for the Rain. Um, and it's a film that's made in collaboration with uh, Kisi Lumusia, who is also the main character of the film. Um, and Thank You for the Rain follows Kisi Lu, a family farmer in Kenya, over five years. This is uh, Kisi Lu. Um, and it follows his complete transformation from a farmer and a father challenged by climate change to a man who takes action in his community and goes all the way to the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris as a local leader. And I would love to start by introducing you to Kisilu and the film by showing you the trailer. Thank you. So I decided to make this film because I felt that the human story of climate change was really not being told. There were stories about statistics of climate change, ice or polar bears, but not really the human story. And I wanted people to feel and really understand that it's the greatest injustice of today, that those who did nothing to cause climate change are the first and hardest hit, and also most often the people furthest removed from power. So that's why Seven years ago, I, I set out trying to make this film. 
And also, I, one other objective was to really challenge the stereotypes that the media often put up with, from Kenya and from other countries in Africa, which is very often very victimizing. Um, and I would love to show you three clips um, from the film that represents some of the bit of the process and some of the challenges we've been facing in making it, and also to talk through um, how we're working with the film so that it can create a real impact and actually create a change. And the first clip I would love to show you, it's uh, three minutes into the film, it's where the story starts. Um, and we, we've been working a lot on, it's always extremely tricky, how do you start your film? Um, what's been really essential for us is to start showing how proactive Kisilo is, his strong determination, his charisma, and to show how he's special. Um, so this you will see in the clip. And also the clip is, um, is an example. Um, it's actually the, the toughest editing decision, I think, at least I, I made when making the film. And that was to include me as a character in the film. That was done very, very late in the edit, and this is an example, and I'll tell you more afterwards. So for um, a very long time, as I said, in the edit, we, only, we were using only the observational footage that we were filming, and Kisilu's own video diary footage, because he also had the camera, and he, that's a very essential part in the film. Uh, and, and some text, very impersonal text. And I, really didn't want to be in the film at all <laughs> because I didn't want to steal any attention and I was afraid like this is Kisilu's film, it's his story and I was afraid that including me could steal some of that in attention in some way. However, we were lucky to be a part of this uh, really great rough cut workshop called Doc Incubator, which is highly recommended. And, and I got challenged a lot there when we showed rough cuts of the film and people were saying like, first of all, you have two cameras, and, it's, and since you have two cameras, we start asking who's behind the other camera when you have Kisilu's camera, and then who's, is, it, is it his wife? Is it a local filmmaker? Is it someone maybe from Norway, from a completely different culture? That makes a big difference. People are like, we really want to know this, the other point of view of the other camera. Um, and then we also got the feedback that and, and I learned through the process that since I've been working with Kisil for five years and we've become so close friends and, and we changed each other's life a lot. So also when I was trying to hide and not be a part of the story, we were actually missing part of Kisilu's story and it didn't make sense in a way. It didn't, didn't feel right. There were a lot of really important story points that was actually missing just because I was trying to hide. So then we decided to, to bring me in and we had a long, it was really hard to figure out how to do it. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm talking a bit in the beginning and then not as much, but throughout the whole film I'm there. And then there's also some shots of me that Kisilu has filmed. Um, and it has really helped us having my, my voiceover and me as a character has helped us to be more efficient in the storytelling. And it's also added this extra story layer of the development of the friendship between me and Kisilu. It's of course not the main story, but it's one, it, it adds extra depth to the film. Um, and I think I'm happy we show the film um, several places and, and no one, everyone agrees that it's still Kisilu's story. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, but if there's one thing I regret after being through this process, it's that it would be relevant to have been film, filming me more in the situations, like we always just filmed, of course, Kisilu, and to maybe some of the conversations we had, all of those things, maybe then that could also have been a part of the, of the film. Uh, I would now love to show you um, another clip. It's one of my favorite clips in the film, and it shows the power of Kisilu's video diary and things that he shares with us that we would never have been able to capture with our, with our camera. And it's 50 minutes into the film, and the context is Kisilu has finally managed to mobilize the community to stand together to fight climate change together in the local community. But then the season hits back and it's more challenging and people drop out. And on the top of that, a big flood comes and destroys Kisilu's trees and his field. So this is what Kisilu filmed one night after that happened. So 
it's it's a very powerful scene, and, and as I said, we would never have managed to film that. What makes it so powerful is that it's Kisilu filming it. He's deciding to show us this. He really wants to tell this, and, and he, this is at night, his wife and kids, they're in bed, he can't share this with them because he don't want to worry them, so, but he decides to share it with us, with the, with the audience. And it's also something that has allowed us in the film to tell the psychological aspects of climate change and to really get, get close to that story of the abstract beast of climate change. That is like, it's so hard, who's, who's the enemy? <laughs> who, are you, who are you fighting? Uh, it's so abstract, you never know when it's gonna hit. It's so unpredictable. Um, and I think, I, I never seen the psychological aspects of climate change at all in, in other films touching on climate change. So I think that's, that's to, Kisilu is so brave in what he's sharing in his video diary and that's really allowing that to happen. Um, yeah, so I'm so happy about that, that close collaboration we've been having in making that possible. Um, I would love to show you um, Kisilu's favorite clip uh, from the film. Um, I, Kisilu loves it because it has this strong message and he believes that when people watch it, they will really understand how frustrating it is with everything that's happening and the climate change. Um, the context of the clip is that it's from the United uh, Nations Climate Change Meeting in Paris and it's been going on for two weeks, and it's supposed to soon come to an end. The nations are not agreeing, and Kisilu has been given a lot of um, negative feedback about how things are going. He's extremely frustrated uh, and worried if they might not come into an agreement that can save his family and the planet, basically. Um, and I never seen Kisilu this angry. I never seen him angry at all during those five years before this, this moment. Um, and it was an extremely challenging situation as a filmmaker because, as I said, we're also friends. And it was really hard to balance in this situation to be both a friend and a filmmaker. Because I felt that Kisili really needed a supportive friend in the moment. But then at the same time, I as a filmmaker, I didn't, I didn't want to intervene. I wanted kind of his emotions to unfold. Uh, so you'll see there's a 40 second gap with silence in, in the middle of it. Uh, which, to not make it feel so long, we filled it with my voiceover. <laughs> so you'll get to see it now. <laughs> yeah, so as I said, that's uh, the only, thing, only time I see Kisilu angry. And, and I think it's a dilemma for us as filmmaker that it's, it's when our or characters are having the hardest time that we also kind of need to be there and just, just film and observe and, and try to capture what's, what's going on. That's uh, something I've been finding very challenging in making this thing, film along the whole way. Um, but a part of it is also, there was a question about like the interview um, setting. And, and the way we have been working, me and Kisilu, is also, I'm, I'm a very listener. <laughs> I, I um, often when Kisilu gets emotional and he speaks about things, if I, if I give him the space, he will continue most often with things that are way more interesting that, than any question of mine could trigger. Because I, I'm not in his mind, I wouldn't be following <laughs> exactly what's going on. Um, so that's also something I was kind of hoping maybe would happen here, but then at this time, Kisilu, he really needed someone to react and be there for him as well. Um, yeah, however, I feel very lucky that this is now Kisilu's favorite scene. Um, and I think the reason for that is that we, um, so we share the same goal in making this film. We really want it to have um, a strong impact, and that brings me to the last point. Um, because Kisilu, now the film is done, but Kisilu and I, we only consider ourselves half done. Now we really need to get the film out to people and to make sure that we put climate justice on the agenda and that we improve the situation for Kisilu, his communities and other farmer communities in East Africa. Um, and can I use this mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Uh, so Kisilu, here he's uh, screening the trailer in his community. That's a pilot in one of the schools. Kisilu is bringing 
the film around in different communities and he's bringing policy makers, organizations and farmers together to expand and to really talk about how they can find solutions together and adapt together. Um, and here, this is Kisilu and his wife with a poster for another screening. Um, and we're planning a whole tour where Kisilu and other people will go screen the film and really, yeah, we really hope to, to really help these communities um, and for people to start to listen to them. Um, and people are starting to listen more and more. Uh, four months ago, Kisilu even sp spoke at the TED uh, Talks in Nairobi. Uh, so that's a big, big journey from the first clip you saw where he was even trying to get out to his local people and now he's, he's getting out to many people in Kenya and internationally. And he's very happy that people are finally listening. Uh, however, we also need to, of course, target the Western countries who are the big emitters. It's not only about adapting in East Africa, it's also about actually stopping to emit carbon gases, climate gases. Uh, so we're preparing a lot of event screenings and local screenings in Europe, and we also have to go to the US. And our goal is to really reach the non-converted, not only the doc audience and the climate activists, we want to bring it really locally, team up with schools, um, with farmers maybe to screen them at barn, to screen the film at barns, um, and with organizations. And we're also going to into international decision making forums to screen the film. Um, so at the and at the website we have a lot of ways that people can take action, support Kisilu's work, and how they can join Kisilu's movement and also a lot of discussion guide, and everyone who wants can actually host a screening of the film. Um, yeah, so now, I think it's gonna be the next five years, focused on how to get Kisilu's story to really create the impact we need. The Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for some questions. Um, so if anyone has a question, we have mics. And I also just wanted, while we're setting that up, to pass along our thanks to Casillo for sharing his story with us today. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Julia? Oh, there's one. Yes. Hello. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's um, incredible. Um, I wanted to know what your process was of finding Casillo and finding the story and how you started your relationship. So as I said, I wanted to tell this human impact of climate change and I knew Kenya from before and that it was highly affected by climate change. So I went on a research trip and I, I met up with many different farmers and then Kisilu was, was one of them. And, and when we met, it was, yeah, we just connected very quickly and yeah, and the way he's so proactive and he had all these visions and all these ideas and, and he was so eager to take part as well. So that's, that's how it started. So did you know before that you wanted to tell it from the point of view of a farmer? Yeah, okay. yeah. But in the beginning we were only gonna film one month, one rainy season, but then so many things happened and we got so close and it ended up being five years. Thank you. There's another question here. Hi, thanks so much. That was really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing the final film. Um, I wonder, I was quite interested in the video diary process and whether or not, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Kisilu, is it, did you give him much training and direction? And were you reviewing the video diaries as it was going? Were you giving him any feedback on it? Or if you can explain the process. Thank yeah. you. So it's, it's been a very collaborative process in many ways. Um, so, yeah, first we, we explained how to use the camera. That was very quickly because Kisilu is very quick in learning new things. So that was not and the challenge. And then, and then we've been talking all along, the, all the five years, like what, what can be relevant. And I think lot, the whole of the film, a lot of what's, what's in it, um, which is not kind of set pieces, has actually been developed through T 
teas and lunches <laughs> where we kind of just speak. And, and for instance, like the ant scene was something that Kisilu, he, he just mentioned that like he was so frustrated and, and he's even been and, and looked at the ants and, and he said what he was saying in this video diary. And then I said, oh, if you happen to go back, could you maybe film it and, and tell it? And then, so it's, a, it's been a very collaborative process all the way. Um, you obviously set up quite young and probably it was your first film, so I was wondering more how the professional cooperation worked when you did get people on board, how long into process, if you could kind of elaborate on, because this is a long process and it will be a long process and how far in did you get and, and yeah, more on the, not financial, but cooperation side, I would say. Uh, so... Yeah, it's been a very long process. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's two, three years in, so, but, but it's actually been made from the first rainy season, I said, I made the short film of that. And then that kind of then sparked some people being more interested in more of the story, and then more things developed. So the first one actually sparked that um, some broadcasters being involved or being interested, um, and then we got um, an external production company on board as the main, Banek Films as the main production company. Um, that was three years, two years in. Um, and then from there, we've been pitching here at Sheffield. We've been pitching, I guess, like three, four places, <laughs> trying to get more people involved. And um, yeah, it's, and then suddenly some broadcasters said yes. And then it was a bit easier, but not easy. <laughs> yeah, still not easy. But yeah, when we, when we started, we had, 3,000 pounds to cover the expenses of going there. That was it. I know yeah. you probably have lots of other questions, but we're out of time. But perhaps um, we're, if you want to see uh, and talk to Julia or Gian, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lovely little cocktail drink section at the end. If for all of those, you stay for all the sessions, you get a drink. So I'm sure you can continue the conversation. I want to thank you both very much. That was just wonderful. Thank you.